My name is Susanne Koch. I'm from Berlin Charité. I'm senior doctor for anesthesiology, neurology and pain medicine. And I'm interested in sustainability um, science, focusing in anesthesia. And I give a presentation about the carbon footprint of volunteer anesthetic agents. Um, in 2018, there was a heavy rainfall in Berlin. The streets were flooded and our basement too. So this was a point when I decided I like to know what's this about climate change. I like to know the scientific facts. Um, and I went to the bookshop and bought this book. It's called Self Selbstverbrennung. So it's self burning from uh, Professor Schellenhuber, who is the main climate scientist in Germany. And he was the one who introduced this um, climate limit 1.5 or 2 degrees so that we shouldn't exceed this limit. And so after reading this book, I, I decided to get active mainly in the anesthesiology due to this fact. So now I, I'll give you a, a short over uh, look about climate science and then come to the anesthetic agents to give you an idea how it is located in climate science. So a history of climate research started back in 1827 and it was uh, Jean-Baptiste Fourier, a mathematics from Paris, who um, questioned the balance of energy on Earth. So he likes to know how does it, the energy balance be is, is stable on Earth, how does it work? And um, after that, he calculated all the data. He figured out that we should have a greenhouse um, aspect on Earth. And in 1856, um, Eunice Newton Food, who is a great granddaughter from Newton, she found out that carbon dioxide is uh, a gas which will um, heat up uh, the atmosphere. So she was the first to state that this, this is a greenhouse gas. And um, in the, if you look at the balance of energy on Earth, so there are three main players. So this is first off the solar radiation, which is mainly influenced by the Milankovitch cycles. So the shape of the orbit uh, of the Earth around the um, uh, sun the angel uh, of the Earth's axis and the uh, Earth's precession. The next impact is um, based on the albedo effect. Albedo is, um, is uh, in, in named white, and this is the reflection of solar radiation from Earth. So this is uh, influenced by the size of ice. Um, uh, on Earth, so the Arctic ice sheets and the Greenland ice sheets, and it also um, is in affected by particles in space, so um, which are, can, are caused by a volcanic eruption or by air pollutions today as well. And the uh, third uh, um, impact is done by greenhouse gases because they reflect infrared radiation from back from Earth to space, which will, when they go to space, they will cool down the Earth. So after reflecting, this will heat up the climate. The um, natural um, greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane and nitro oxide. And well, this is a, um, a picture I saw in the book from Schellenhuber, which um, frightened me most. So here you see these uh, carbon dioxide parameters on Earth from the last 800,000 years. So here's today, and here's um, 800,000 years before present. And here down on this uh, screen, you see the um, oscillation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere within the last 800,000 years. These um, data were picked based on an ice core drilling in the Antarctic. And um, so you, you had a layer from these uh, ice cores. It's like, like in trees, you can figure out in which time scale you are. And um, in those, in small air bubbles, they um, calculate, they could assess the CO2 um, concentration and they, based on um, oxygen iso isotopes, they could uh, calculate the temperature at the same time. So 
based on these, they have these um, data and you see that the COG con CO2 concentration and the temperature is high coherent throughout the time, the whole time point. And you can see that the um, carbon dioxide concentration never exceeded 280 parts per million. So this is a small uh, concentration parts per million. And nowadays we have, so since the 13th of April this year, we um, reached 420 parts per million. So this is way out of the physiological CO2 pattern of Earth from the last 800,000 years. And um, it's important to know that um, Homo sapiens only exists since 300,000 years on Earth. So it's the fact that no generation before us has ever um, lived in an atmosphere like we do at the moment and our children will do in the next years. So, and if you look on the uh, um, carbon and dioxide breathing pattern nowadays so they are recorded in the atmosphere at hawaii and the manua loa observatorium and um, here you can see that since 1960 the carbon dioxide concentration is still rising you can go on the website of the national ocean oceanic and atmospheric administration website and see this every day if you want and you see these oscillation here this is um, related to the um, rhythm which is seen every year so during um, spring and summer um, due to the blossom up of plants and trees in the northern hem hemisphere we have a, a huge sink in carbon dioxide concentrations every year and uh, this will go up in the winter times again and however these uh, increase rate the growth rate is increasing over years again so in in the decade between 1960 to 1970 um, every year the uh, carbon dioxide concentration raised by 0.9 parts per million and now it's by 2.4 so it's just still rising here and if we look where the carbon dioxide fluxes come from since 1880 so here you see the emissions of carbon dioxide and here you see the sinks also. You see that after the Second World War II, there's a high increase based on fossil fuel industry, um, which emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and the change in land use also emits some carbon dioxide. And you see that plants already absorbed a part of it. So this is a sink and there is still carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the oceans causing an acidification in the oceans here. And the, da the data show also that even when the book, uh, The Limits to Growth in 1972 and the, uh, was published and the IPCC was founded in 1988 and the Rio conference took place in 1992, it didn't matter. So the um, CO2 emissions in the atmosphere they just went up. And the main problem of this heating up of our Earth's climate system is that there are tipping points within this climate system, which will be reached after we have a, a, a warming in the atmosphere. And if they are reached and cross the tipping point, so we have the problem that um, we can't uh, uh, stop it again. So the first um, tipping elements would be the melting of ice sheets on Greenland, Arctic or West Antarctic ice sheets. After this, when they, they melt down, so this will have an um, impact on the thermohyaline circulation. So the Gulf Stream may um, stop going and um, this will have again influence on the um, Nino, El Nino phenomenon and uh, Amazon rainforest will dry out. So these are all um, uh, inter interaction of the tipping points, which will destabilize the networks. And this will lead the way that we will go to the hothouse earth, which we can't solve then after that anymore. And um, 
the the earth will then look like this. So we have uh, tremendous floodings around the world. We have wildfires or um, hurricanes. So these are all pictures from last year. In Germany, we had a tremendous um, flood flooding here where over 150 pay, uh, persons died. And um, that's what we will face more frequently if the atmosphere will heat up. So now we come to the volatile anesthetics. Um, they also do reflect um, infrared radiation from uh, in within the atmospheric windows. So here you see the solar radiation coming in. Here you see the infrared radiation going out, and um, the the uh, f um, Normal greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, they, they left out a window here at 10 micrometers. And just within this window, um, the anesthetic gases, as well as other carbon, um, uh, hydrofluorocarbon uh, substances, will reflect um, infrared radiation. And that is why they have a hundred to thousand fold higher carbon footprint compared to carbon dioxide with ha which has a carbon footprint of one which is a reference gas um the greenhouse gases are still rising this is the last ipcc report published in march 2022 and here you see that um within the last decade still based on fossil fuel industry carbon dioxide is rising you see methane is rising a little bit, nitrous oxide is rising, but what's obvious here is that the F gases or hydrofluorocarbon uh, gases are rising also. Down here, you can see it more distinctly. So there is a treaty which was um, done in 2016 in Kigali. It's an amendment to the Montreal Protocol where the um, countries around the world uh, agreed to phase out hydrofluorocarbon um, substances. And based on this treaty alone, we we have uh, saved up um, 0.4 degrees Celsius of additional warming when we look to 2100. So this, if we've done um, business as usual with this, without the treaty, we would have another additionally heating up of 0.5. But what is important here is as their anesthetic agents are not included in this treaty because they are medical substances. There is a study done by Fulmer in 2015 who showed that um, volatile, volatile anesthetic agents are assessed are rising in atmosphere and they assessed it all around the world. So here up you see death flow rain and here down is a sebo flow rain and he assessed the um, um, concentration in the North Pacific in the Jungfraunjok, which is a mountain in Switzerland and in the Antarctica. So since since um, market um, the sebo flow rain and death flow rain is increasing. The healthcare sector has a high carbon dioxide emission itself. It equals to 4.4% of the global carbon dioxide emissions. 4% are related to the healthcare sector, which is higher in developed country for the US. It would be 7.6 of the national emissions. So Europe has also higher um, carbon footprint based on their healthcare sector compared to South Asia, where it's lower. So now we, we come to the operating theaters, and um, it's a study done by McNeil, who um, analyzed the carbon footprint of, of operating theaters from three university hospitals. One is in Vancouver, Canada, Minnesota, US, and John Hopkins in the UK. And she uh, analyzed three scopes. So this was one, the anesthetic gases, the energy sector and the waste sector. And what you can see that the fractions here in the blue sector is, um, show a big difference. So which where the John Hopkins had the lowest part 
of emissions, and this is um, only uh, caused by a not using desflurane. So the John Hopkins Hospital in former days, desflurane was more expensive, so they decided not to use desflurane at all. And so they have a tenfold reduction. As you can see here, Vancouver and Minnesota had over 2,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents each year compared to only 200 tons uh, by the John Hopkins. On the other hand, the energy sector also shows a big difference where in Vancouver they have an eight-fold reduction because in Vancouver they mainly use hydroelectrics, so they have an eight-fold reduction due to renewable energy. And in Minnesota was the newest building, so they used many uh, energy saving strategies and the buildings were um, newly, so they had a threefold reduction compared to um, John Hopkins, whereas Minnesota and John Hopkins both had a coal-based um, um, grid uh, energy. So, and here, so the old building in the UK and coal grid, so they had four th more than 4,344 tons every year carbon dioxide um, emissions. In the waste sector, you, you don't see big differences here within these three hospitals. However, if you um, use all the optimals, so like uh, not using desflurane, use renewable energy and energy saving strategies, you might uh, reduce your uh, carbon footprint even in a university hospital to 1,280 tons each year. So um, these, these data from McNeil were focusing on the global warming footprint of anesthetic gases over 100 years and on the kilogram of the carbon footprint. So Ötzelzel in 2019 published a paper where he said it's not, it's not just because um, the atmospheric lifetime of volatile anesthetics is below 20 years for each substance. So it's for zifofluoran, it's only one year. For isofluoran, it's 3.2 years. And for desfluoran, it's 14 years. So he told it's, it's better to have a look at the whole range of the global warming footprint. And as you can see, the impact on the global warming is highest within the first 20 years after emission of the anesthetic gases. And it, moreover, he told that anesthetic gases are differently clinically used in concentrations. So for sevoflurane in mean, you need 6%. So sevoflurane uh, 2% for desflurane 6%. And this has also an impact. So he um, calculated here and presented the carbon dioxide equivalents um, during clinical use for one mark and in minimal flow, 0.5 liters per, mini, uh, per minute. And here you see that there's a huge difference for desflurane um, if you include all these data. So if you uh, like to have an idea what's this about, here are some driving equivalents. So if you do a seven hour anesthesia with one of these substances, isoflurane, sevoflurane, or desflurane, if you do a one MAC and for one liter per minute fresh gas flow and you look at the global warming potential in one year, you can drive for isoflurane, you come from Berlin to Monaco, which is in France, or you go to from Berlin to Marseille in France again for sevoflurane. However, if you uh, do a desflurane anesthesia, you can go with uh, of, uh, Liberia uh, to Monrovia. So you have to sit four hours in the usual car, uh, which is equivalent to CO2 emissions of seven hour anesthesia. There are two apps. One is uh, produced in jail. They are uh, free. You can download it on your smartphone. Jail gassing greener or anesthesia impact. And then you, you put in the actual anesthesia you're doing and then you can, um, they calculate you the your carbon footprint of your actual anesthesia. Um, Jody Sherman then asked how how about propofol, so she likes to compare uh, in life cycle analysis the greenhouse gas emissions on anesthetic drugs, the volatile anesthetics, desfluorane, isofluorane, zivofluorane, 
and compared to propofol. And what she found, well, the greenhouse gas emissions is highest for death row, and that's what we know already. However, if you look at the drug synthesis, transportation, delivery, disposal, waste, you see that even if you look at these um, impacts, you see that e even in this part, Desferland has the highest carbon footprint and propofol is still lowest down here. And she calculated here um, with a 50% waste rate and uh, she also, uh, propofol needs to burn, so incineration by a thousand degrees and then it's destroyed so this is a correct um, waste and um, that was calculated here in the study um, so there are some people who who have concerns about the environmental toxicity for propofol however i just told you that if you if you do incineration over a thousand degrees celsius for two seconds, so propofol is destructed and um, you can, there's no influence on the environment. However, there are many people who are not correctly uh, use the correct um, disposal for propofol, so they put it in the sink or a usual bin, so this is not nice. This is a study done by Schneider where they um, did a training and they found before the intervention that about 25% um, put propofol, not empty propofol vials in the usual bins, but after the training, this was reduced to 3.4 whales. So you can improve. Um, however, there's a, in Stockholm Council, they do um, environmental assessments for pharmaceuticals and they uh, did a toxic uh, analysis also for propofol. And they found that the, the PTB score the propofol has potentially maybe potentially persistent but it has no bioaccumulation potential and it has moderate chronic toxicity so the overall it has a low environmental risk so it's not really a risky environmental substance the use of voluntary anesthetic agents around the world. There are surveys done in France, India, Australia, and Germany. So they found that sevoflurane is the most used agent around the world, followed by propofol, regional anesthesia, and desflurane in France, Australia, and Germany. However, in India, they use more isoflurane and halothan. Nitrous oxide is only rarely used, only in India, they use it still in 35% of anesthesia and mostly people around the world use low flow or even minimal flow. So the 32% is in, in India and the 90% here from Germany, France and New Zealand, Australia in between. So what about the solutions? So there's um, a study in from Wisconsin, Wisconsin in Madison University. They did an education training in the university. They put stickers on the ventilators to make people aware that Zivofluran is the better way to choose compared to Desfluran. And they found based on these trainings that the Desfluran um, use was reduced by 55% during the study. Sevoflurane increased a little bit and this saved them $300,000 a year and 2,965 tons for carbon dioxide emissions per year. Another chance to save the problem is um, the carb uh, vapor capture technology. So you, you put um, cartridges or filters to the ventilator, which will absorb the anesthetic gases. So this is still in its infancy. However, here's the first life cycle analyst, analysis done in the UK. Um, and they compared um, capture technology. So all these um, data refer to a um, vapor capture technology and they used low flow or minimal flow anesthesia down here you see the propofol carbon footprint of propofol and here you see the carbon footprint of zebofluran isofluran or desfluran and the a and b refers to the synth synthesis um, 
method. So there's a new method which is saves more energy, the B1. So this is the optimal version. So you, you use minimal flow and the B method for the synthesis. And you see that if you use um, propofol, you have a carbon footprint at this point. And if you use minimal flow and the optimal method for the synthesis, and you reach the carbon footprint of propofol for sevoflurane and for isoflurane, but you won't reach it for desflurane even in the optimal setting. And if you do low flow anesthesia, which is also frequently with one liter per minute, you see that none of these substances will ever reach the low um, carbon footprint of propofol. Um, and there's another new method um, which is destroying the waste anesthetic agent. This is just done in some uh, single trials, so with three or um, numbers of three or six. And they found that the, by, they like to um, destroy by ultraviolet light reaction the anesthetic gases. And they found that this works only for zebrafluran and desfluran in minimal and low flow anesthesia, but it doesn't work for nitrous oxide. So this is still a, a technique which, which needs to develop if it will be used in daily practice. And now this is a proposal just recently published by the European Commission, which says the use of desferan for as annihilation anesthetic is prohibited as from the 1st January of 2006, except when such use is strictly required and no other anesthetic can be used. So this is a proposal and I think this is correct way to go within the next years. And now I come to my take home uh, message. So I, I say volatile anesthetic agents are highly potent greenhouse gases. And I think it's best to stop using desflurane whenever possible. And you generally should use minimal or low flow anesthesia from start of anesthesia from the induction on. Um, new technologies are still in its infancies and they have less capacity for desfluorine compared to sevoflurane. Um, in general, it's recommended to switch to renewable energies and um, it's recommended to implement energy saving technologies in your hospitals. And I recommend everybody from you to read and follow climate scientists or to follow the NOAA website in the US. I think it's a perfect website. You get much to know, to learn there. Thank you for your attention. So this is a picture. It's done by the Fridays for Future in during the Corona pandemic in Berlin. So they put all their uh, slides on the um, be in the front of the the parliament in Berlin. So I think it's a great picture. And um, so if, if you don't get the chance to ask your questions, you just may email me. Thank you.